Craft Lake City, we are a 501c3 nonprofit organization. Our mission is to educate, promote, and inspire local artisans while elevating the creative culture of the Utah arts community through science, technology, and art. Many of you know us for our annual DIY festival, but we also host year-round programming and curation. Uh, we do monthly workshops, and then of course, our celebration of the hand series, which we're here today to talk about. Um, we like to thank our partners. Without the generous support of these partners listed here, we would not be able to provide this wonderful exhibition. And then, of course, Celebration of the Hand. Now, these placots, um, the show that we're talking about today, Celebration of the Hand with Laya Yang, was installed in January of this year and will be running through the end of March. It's a free outdoor exhibition. It's open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We implore you all to take a socially distanced walk with your friends or family and look at the work in person. And now I'd like to introduce our Artisan and Programs Coordinator, Shelby, Shelby Ling. She will be introducing Laya. Hi everyone, thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm really excited that all of you are here to learn a bit about Laya and about this work. Um, I do have her bio up here. We can just read it quickly together. Um, Laya Yang is a visual artist born and raised in Salt Lake City, Utah by immigrant parents. She received a BFA in painting and drawing from the University of Utah, but has an interest in many visual mediums, including three-dimensional materials and photography. In 2018, Yang was among the first local makers to be selected as an artisan scholar for the annual Craft Lake City DIY Festival Artisan Scholarship and Mentor Program. Um, so I had the pleasure of meeting Laya through the Artisan Scholarship Program and um, just absolutely fell in love with her work. Um, <laughs> I actually own this uh, piece here on the left, this mirror helmet piece, which was the series that Laya was presenting at the festival as a scholar. And um, I was just so excited to see something so interesting and so beautiful and just wanted to learn more. So um, Laya, I would love to ask you a couple of questions quickly. Um, and please, as Angela mentioned, any Anyone here, if you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat so that we can have this be an interactive um, conversation. Um, but Laya, I'd love to kind of start here, if we could, with Mir Helmet. And um, I know that the series of work that you created for Celebration of the Hand that's now on view downtown evolved from this particular project. So can you tell us a little bit about the original Mir Helmet project how and how that came about? Yeah. Um... First of all, thank you to Craft Lake City, and I really appreciate this opportunity. Um, but so the original mirror helmet was, as you can see, just kind of a literal box on your head helmet piece, um, and it's made out of mirrors. Um, so, and I photograph them in different environments. So the mirrors kind of distort and reflect what's around it in different ways, um, and sometimes in unexpected ways. And so kind of, for me, it was drawing that parallel between like the visual and kind of a psychological idea of um, identity almost and just like individuals and how, you know, we like to what extent are we a product of our environment? To what extent like can you choose to reflect something that's different from what's around you or the same as what's around you kind of just like I think there's a lot of different uh, little narratives that I had a lot of fun with these images and like uh, kind of posing these models in different areas. Um, and so something that was important to me is having the like model, like the human's face covered up. Um, I think there's kind of something reassuring about that. Like it's, I think like a lot of my models have talked about how it's like, it makes it easier to just kind of, uh, float almost like you're not so self-conscious um, but I think at the same time it also makes these I think of them as characters not really individuals like even though obviously it's different bodies in each image and different models they're all kind of avatars for this singular but also general being um, like I see them as stand-ins for myself or for stand-ins of somebody general or a made-up kind of alien character uh, so that was kind of mirror helmet and where that project came from. Leah, could you talk a little bit about kind of 
how the work Celebration of the Hand, this current work differs from this Mirror, mirror Helmet series. Yeah, um, so these are completely new headpieces that I made. They're made out of shards, so really small pieces. They're crunched down almost, like much smaller pieces, much more compact. Um, they don't directly reflect the environment in the same way because they're too fractured. And I kind of feel like it's a parallel to the process of growing up a little bit where when you're younger, I guess, like you start off kind of just naively imitating and reflecting what's around you. And as you go through life, you know, things happen, things break, you know, on purpose, on accident. Um, and for me, for this idea of celebration of the hand and these masks, I wanted to kind of convey this idea of picking up broken pieces of yourself or of whatever and continue to add them back in and to create something beautiful from whatever was broken. Um, again, kind of just relating that back to the process of life. Like as you're going through, just because something broke doesn't mean it's gone forever. You can still build yourself back up again and again, or that's an aspiration at least and my admiration. Um, but yeah, you know, I think I, I'm definitely the kind of person I attached a lot of personal meaning and a lot of personal metaphors to these mirrors that we can definitely get into later. But I think like for, well, for both of the projects really, but like kind of more saturated here is I, just this idea of trying to figure out how small pieces that are dissonant and mismatched and, you know, don't seem like they should fit together but they do fit together into this whole. So how do they fit together? To what extent can we choose how they fit together? Um, and whether that's a metaphor for an individual, as I was saying, or as a society, which I think um, kind of ties in with the celebration of the hand uh, as a whole, like the um, previous projects, I think, just, you know, with urbanization, like how does our community fit together as a whole with all these small pieces? Excellent. And, and um, I love that, that description and all of that insight, Leia. Um, and I, we added this, uh, one of these images that's currently on view in Celebration of the Hand to kind of show a close up of what you're talking about with the fractured mask and the fractured pieces that you've put together for this gorgeous headpiece, um, just to kind of ooh, contrast. So with Mirror Helmet, it was much more of a cube, right? And really with Mirror Helmet, it reflected the landscape that your characters were placed in. So it was, it was almost as, uh, as much about their surroundings um, as anything else. Whereas it sounds like from what you're describing, the significance, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but with all of the fractured glass, is that um, it's much less about reflecting what's around you and more about kind of self-perception and resilience as a community and as an individual and, and really playing with those ideas of identity. Is that, am I on base? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, the cool thing is like, that's not like, I think so many people will just like, tell me what they see in these images. And I'll be like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's exactly. Uh, I didn't think of that, but yes. Um, but also, yeah, I think exactly what you said, like rather than having the focus be on both surrounding and individuals kind of focusing in the, into the individual, whatever, like collective or individual, individual. That's great. Um, you know, you have such a diverse set of landscapes in your work. Um, some of these photographs are set against a busy city background while others are in this kind of serene natural setting. How did you choose the settings for these photos in this series and what role does landscape play in this project? Yeah, um, I really, for this project, I you know, just wanted it to be a celebration of Salt Lake. You know, I was born and raised here, I still live here. It's my home, I love Salt Lake um, and kind of the surrounding landscape. Um, so for, I definitely wanted to incorporate um, both man-made structures and um, kind of the natural landscape, I guess, that, because uh, for me personally, I think that, uh, and I'm sure a lot of people who live in Utah, like the natural um, 
you know, desert is definitely a big part of my mental image of home and what home means in Utah. Um, kind of losing track of what I said, <laughs> I guess. So I wanted to just, yeah, be a celebration of that um, and have a range. So originally I was thinking like, oh, it could be all of Utah. And I, but then I think with the pandemic, I was like, I'm not driving more than two hours. Like me and my models have to take separate cars. I'm not paying for two cars worth of gas for more than two hours away. So that did bring the focus down into like Salt Lake a little bit. Um, so, you know, I, but I think like that's kind of the idea is it's, it's not just one or the other. It's definitely a combination of indoor and outdoor and like man-made and natural structures. Like all of these do fit together with me and with all of us to create our community and our home. And I remember one of the things we talked about, um, we were just talking before we went live with everyone about how we, we began this conversation about a year ago. And I remember in that initial conversation, Laya, you were talking a lot about kind of uh, the contradictions that you find um, both within yourself and your own identity and then also the contradictions that exist within Salt Lake City um, and can you talk a little bit about that about kind of that um, those conflicting qualities yeah sorry really quick I just got a text from my friend who says they need to be let in is that oh let me go and make sure is that the thing there you go. Oh, okay. Perfect. Cool. <laughs> um, sorry to interrupt, but anyways, uh, so for contradictions, yeah. Um, so for me personally, and I think just, I guess I want to preface this to say that uh, in the beginning of this project, I really was like, I, I like got a little overwhelmed because I was like, oh, you know, like, I want to represent our city. I want to be inclusive. Like, how can I bring in diversity? And like, how can, you know, but I think that's just kind of silly to try to do with a single perspective and impossible to do from a single perspective, which is kind of the point of diversity. Um, but so anyway, so just to preface that this is a very personal uh, and limited viewpoint from my experiences, but uh, so I, my parents are immigrants. They're, they came to the U.S. from China, and then I was born here. And so I think growing up for me, it was a uh, just like always, you know, in Utah, it's like we have a little bit of racial diversity, but there's not that much really. <laughs> and so I think growing up, it was a little bit isolating because it's just like my family is so so visibly different from what I was seeing around me, um, and also you know just being kind of inclined towards the creative like art making that I think sometimes that can be a little bit isolating feeling like not you know you can yourself you can perceive yourself as isolated sometimes um and you know I as I get older I kind of am realizing that's not like unique necessarily to my perspective I think everybody does have that feeling where like oh, I'm the only person who doesn't belong in this room, <laughs> kind of like, oh, everybody has it together and I don't. Um, but like, but everybody's thinking that sort of. <laughs> um, and so I, I guess just that's something I'm really interested in. And like, uh, cause I, you know, for me, it's like my culture at home is very different, but I don't completely fit in with like my parents, like traditional Chinese culture either, but I'm, also, you know, Asian, I'm not, I don't fit in with white culture either. So I think just having, that's constantly on my mind and like other aspects as well. So just how do you combine different cultures? Um, and I guess you can expand that to a society level. Like I think most people, when you think of Utah, you think of, oh, it's very um, homogenous. We're kind of a religious state. You know, there's a lot of uh, Mormon, culture that's very embedded in the state but also like salt lake city itself like uh especially downtown is quite liberal and i think there's a quite strong counterculture here as well so those are also kind of opposing things that we still coexist and like how do we fit together they don't have to be opposites like they can still we're still cohesively part of the same whole and that's just an interesting idea to me well, and I'd love to connect what you're talking about, Laya, into something that you mentioned 
in your artist statement. Um, you mentioned in your statement that you had a desire to recontextualize how we think of people in our city. Um, could you expand upon that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, going back to uh, just I, <laughs> like, I think there's something really funny to me about having these kind of like almost fashion glam shots with these models and like, but their faces are completely covered up. <laughs> um, like I, I just, uh, so that's kind of one aspect of it, of recontextualizing like how we think of an individual. And like, I think there's something very captivating about mirrors that like, you know, we're so entranced by like, it's this idea of like glamor and beauty and vanity. And um, I think social media has a lot of that where it's just like kind of dead face stares that in my mind might as well be a mirror mask, you know, it's about the same thing. Um, but then on the other hand, also like just what kind of uh, like bodies, what kind of individuals are we seeing in like billboards and in advertisements and around us? Like I think Salt Lake City is actually quite diverse, um, both, you know, in, you know, uh, different ethnicities and like uh, immigrant cultures, as well as like gender identities and like sexualities. And we just like they exist. And I, I really just want to see more of that. And I really hope I can at least contribute a little bit more to having those images up, <laughs> those kinds of images up. That's fantastic. And um, yeah, I love, I love hearing more about that idea of recontextualizing how we see people in the place we live in. Um, and, and I think that your work does do that. So <laughs> thank you for, <laughs> for creating it and sharing it in this way. And I, I also am interested in learning a bit about, um, I know that when, when we first met, um, I learned that you had a background in painting and drawing, and then you also had created these like incredible sculptures. I think you had some like public sculpture that was on view up at the University of Utah and um, you work in all of these different mediums. So I'm, I would love to hear a little bit about what motivated you to approach this project through the lens of photography. And also you created these mirror masks as well. So they're kind of wearable sculptures, but what was the motivation behind that? Yeah. So uh, yeah, I went to the U and I was a painting and drawing major. I was there for five years studying painting and drawing and promptly left all that behind when I graduated is what I like to joke about. But um, so during my time at the U, I, I think around my third year there, I started, they offer some classes um, that are in like draw. The first, my gateway, I guess, was a drawing installation class with Al Denier up there. Um, and it's kind of about moving beyond the limits of two dimensions and like taking drawing and creating installations that like you can walk into. So into three dimensions basically. And then from there, that was really cool. So I started taking a couple classes in the sculpture and intermedia, uh, intermedia department. Um, and there's a professor who's in charge of that uh, department at the U, Wendy Wisher. And I took some classes from her and I feel like that really changed the way I look at art and creating art. Um, she is just so incredible. Like it wasn't about like, oh, you have to learn these different medias. I think one of the thing that I really learned, things that I really learned from her was just to have a concept and, you know, come up with something that you want to create and then choose the medium that fits that concept that can serve as the best vehicle to push that concept rather than trying to come up with an idea that fits into whatever medium you make. Um, Obviously there's value to both, but I really enjoy that idea. And I think it was really freeing to me just to, I feel like I had all these like weird self-imposed limitations where it's like, oh, I have to be a painter. Or like, oh, I can't do that. It's, you know, it's too abstract or it's too, oh, I can't work in this medium. I don't know how, like, I think it really opened up my world to like, oh, if I want to do something, I just need to figure out what the best way of conveying this idea is. And then I can figure out the media as like, I can figure out the how as I go along, if I can just figure out what I want to do first. Um, so that was, yeah, it was just very liberating to me. So I went from uh, painting to sculpture. And then one of the projects, the mirror helmet actually first started at my very last semester for a project at the U. Um, and I think it started off as kind of more of a performance piece. That was at least my intention, but I think it just, 
sorry, can you hear that? <laughs> They're doing construction next door. Um, so yeah, the photography medium just made it so much easier to uh, convey what was happening, you know, to a wider audience. And then it just became so fun. Like it's with mirrors, it's, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Can you, is that disruptive? You're fine. It's, it's, we're all, you know, working from home. You're good. <laughs> oh okay. Um, so the vit photography medium, I think, with mirrors, there's so much possibility for colors and it's so quick. Like I can take a model with me to a location and, you know, shoot, you know, 200 photographs and then we can go home and I can slowly work through them and pick one or two. You know, I think there's something really, again, liberating about the medium there where you can just, and I honestly don't consider myself a photographer. <laughs> it's something I also need to, uh, do an asterisk like I don't I think I still have a lot to learn about photography as a medium and I don't think my work I don't know that it would fit into like photography as a genre of art really so I, I feel a little more comfortable calling it just visual art rather than saying I'm a photographer because I just don't think my skills there are <laughs> up to par from what a photographer might expect but yeah, I just enjoy it's a it's a great visual media to convey what I convey ideas efficiently. Well, you do a fantastic job conveying your ideas through <laughs> photography. So thank you for that. And thanks for sharing that story about your university experience. Um, are there any other like very impactful experiences um, that you'd like to share about kind of building your career as an artist? Um, you know, I think I'm still struggling. <laughs> um, I, you know, it's, uh, I think, especially once graduating from art school, essentially, it's just like, oh, shoot, well, now what? Um, but, you know, for actually Craft Lake City and the DIY festival was quite impactful for me. Um, just the experience of uh, being, because that being in a festival and presenting your work in like a marketplace setting is very different from like fine art and like art galleries, you know, it's a very different experience. It's a very different process in preparation as well. Um, so kind of, again, I think I really, just the lesson that really stuck to me is just to spread and like reach out and try different mediums, try different outlets, try different uh, like outlets for sales. I mean, um, and different, you know, communities, mm, is that the right word? Like just different, uh, like organizations that are there to help artists, I think. Um, and kind of like opportunities are there. You just kind of have to reach out and apply for them a lot of times. And like, that's something that is, I try to remind myself of and keep in the forefront when I'm trying to figure out what to do next. <laughs> I think that's such great advice for other artists too, to apply, uh, to look for those opportunities and apply. I mean, you applied for our artisan scholar and mentorship program. And, and got in, you know, without a hitch. <laughs> I'm very surprised and very honored about that. Um, how, <laughs> how did, the, that pro, did that program impact you in any way? Yeah, I mean, it gave me, you know, it's, I think it's just a really great opportunity for uh, just people who are starting out and like don't necessarily know uh, what's going on, <laughs> kind of. So that uh, Artisan Scholar program, you know, not only was it help just like so many resources to kind of from people who are more veteran in the industry to like just advice and like ways to like ideas on how to set up and things to watch out for and having like a specific mentor was really helpful to just just have you know sometimes I think it's just having somebody who's walked this path already to talk to and just like reassure you and be like it's okay like this is you know some things that happened to me, these are some things you can expect, like these are some, you know, this is, these are some things you should look out for, but also here, like it's really rewarding. And like, I think it's just reassuring to have that, like a community in the area that you want to go for that. I think sometimes, I think, cause so many artists are self-employed. Um, so it's not like we have that kind of like, oh, big company that you can climb the ladder on. Like there's not really a corporate, like an art corporation for all artists. So it's really good to just have that kind of community and mentorship, I think was really great. 
Awesome. I love hearing that. I think um, it's always good to learn what what has worked for artists and for other emerging artists, what, you know, they should be doing to uh, sort of get that support. So yeah, thank you for sharing all of that. Um, and I, I have I have another question for you. So uh, when we first met, we talked a little bit about the idea behind the celebration of the hand project series in general. And um, it's largely informed by uh, ideas from Jane Jacobs, who was an activist in New York City and that really championed um, self-organized urbanism and um, believed very passionately that cities should be designed by and for the people who actually live in them. And so through these, we call them placats, uh, with a German word for poster, <laughs> through these um, frames on the street that we use to display this work, um, we really believe that artists are an important part of that equation. And so I I just want to hear a little bit about your thoughts on what you think um, the play, what role artists should be playing in their cityscapes. Yeah, um, you know, so I think so. <laughs> the first thing that kind of comes to mind is, you know, with like the pandemic and everything. You know, I think it's a struggle because I think arts are and artists are always the first to be cut, right? Like we're deep, like non-essential and like, um, it's really hard. Uh, Cause I, it's hard to quantify the value that art brings to a place, but I think it is an essential part of humanity, you know? And like just being in a beautiful space, I think is just important mentally for you know the people who live there, whether they realize it or not. Um, I do think that something I've been a little bit uh, disillusioned with lately is just kind of the role that art can play in social change. Um, so whether, the, you know, we've had a lot of, you know, last summer, especially just like uh, a lot of protests and um, in the last couple of years, lots of, you know, people are trying to raise awareness about like climate change. And, you know, there's so many issues that I think to expect art to uh, create social change is a little bit unrealistic <laughs> and, uh, you know, kind of doomed for disappointment if that's what you're pivoting your social movement. And I think like social change comes from people, not from art. Uh, but, on the other hand, I think I do think that art is an important role where you know it can serve as inspiration, it can serve as reminders, it can serve as something to rally behind. Um, so that's kind of my <laughs> a little bit, you know, a little making myself sad about like what use is art really in creating a lasting social change. But on the other hand, you know, I think just in a day to day sorry, uh, in a day-to-day -day manner. I think art is really important in cities. And I think that to have something, you know, I think the value of like fine art and custom art is that it's not like just generic. It has like a spirit and it has the soul and it brings life to the city. And I think it can make people think, or maybe not, maybe it's just aesthetic, but either way, I think just to have visual stimuli around you is vital to, keeping the population like aware and present and yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Leia. Let's talk about your, the specific piece that we're looking at right now, Give. So, you know, several of your pieces a part of this celebration of handwork are designed in pairs. Um, this piece, Give, was intentionally placed next to another piece called Take. Could you talk just a little bit about why you created that specific pairing and how they kind of work together? I'm so sorry. I'm actually gonna move into my bedroom because this is ridiculously loud. Um, but yeah, so this actually, this pairing was one that I was really, really excited about. Um, and it's one that I, I think um, had a mental image of very early on in the process. It was one of the first pieces that I drew a thumbnail for. Sorry, you can see all my dirty hanging laundry. Um, so I, you know, one of the key keywords, I guess I had for this piece was this idea of wingspan. 
um, and I'm not Christian, but it just kind of thinking about that word, like, uh, brings out connotations of like angels, of flight, um, controlled falling. I wanted something that conveys like the simultaneous weightlessness, but strength at the same time and the duality between strength and weakness and tenderness. Um, and so I also really wanted this pairing specifically to be very expressive, um, just because I think you'll notice with a lot of the other ones there, the figures are pretty motionless. Like, as I said earlier, they're meant to serve more as avatars than uh, expression, like, ex what am I trying to say? Like, just, they're not necessarily, the body itself is not meant to be what you're looking at. But in this case, I did want to have movement. Um, so, uh, I actually, so the model in Give is actually John Kim. He's a dancer for RDT, the Repertory Dance Theater. And I'm so thankful that he agreed to work with me in the middle of a pandemic. Um, and it's just incredible to work with a performer, you know, people who are used to being looked at and want to be photographed, <laughs> I think is a big, uh, it, it made a big difference, but um well, and I, th I think you can really tell that that's a dancer in that photograph. I mean, just the way their body is moving, they really convey all of those ideas that you were talking about that you were looking for. Yeah, and um, I think like another kind of aspect that, that was kind of important to me was this idea of, uh, not really an idea, but just to have like an ambiguous gender, I guess. So, sorry, I'm, I'm so sorry. <laughs> uh, so I wanted kind of, so another thing is the first time I met him, I like took a look at him and I was like, oh my God, I think I just found an alternate universe of myself. Like we're wearing the same glasses. We have the same haircut. Like I, I'm so vain, <laughs> but you know, it was really cool. So we, we shot a lot of stuff. I talked to him a lot about kind of what I had in mind, but I wanted to leave it up to him because I think he would know better than me, like how to express his body. Um, but again, thinking about just like the key word was wingspan. <laughs> and so I chose this image out of the set specifically because I think it just, to me, really embodies this like spirit of generosity almost. Like it's, you know, like I just have this mental narrative of like just giving of selflessness, uh, bordering almost into sacrifice, which uh, is another concept I think about quite often with my parents and uh, just, growing like what does the word like what is worth sacrificing um and I think with this concept of giving I think it's not about giving until you have nothing left and I think that's really important to me um because I think you know especially a lot of em empathetic people have that issue where you know you give and give and give and give and you're kind of left with nothing for yourself so I think I really want it to embody like strength and like developing a certain degree of flexibility within yourself before you have the strength to help others and to lift them with you rather than deplete yourself. Um, and then as a pairing with take, um, again, with take is also about like kind of weightlessness and to embody the tender side of the coin there. I think it's, you know, to, to give with strength and passion and to take with grace and gentleness. And um, I think this can be, it's almost like a reminder to myself in a way. It's something I aspire to, whether you can apply it to your relationships with other people or you know, with your family or with strangers, but also I think kind of our you know, relationship of humanity as a whole with the environment maybe like what are we taking from the environment like how can we you know we, you can't not take from the environment so how can we do that with gentleness and mindfulness um but also i think give and take within yourself like this is a two sides of the same coin within yourself too like how can you balance uh fire and tenderness um yeah, I think. 
Yeah, I love all of that. And I, I also, one of the things I really love about this pairing is that it's, um, at least to me when I saw it, especially installed, is that it, it it's still very much part of that theme of duality and like contradictory elements working together, giving and taking and the way that the, um, you know, characters are moving toward one another. So um, I love that too, is it's just a continuation of that theme. Thank you. Um, yeah, Bloom, are we, did you have a question or should I just jump into it? This is one yeah, of my- Yeah, I do. Yeah, but I wanna hear what you, what you have to say first. <laughs> so, okay, well, so I guess another thing was, so there are 14 placards total and uh, they're kind of divided into groups in the way that just the streets that they're laid out on. And so I really wanted to take that into consideration when I was laying these out. Um, and it's, it's not necessarily important to me for other people to notice, but the, for me, just to organize my thoughts and to kind of become a source um, and just to like to narrow down all the images that I had, it was, I really wanted to have them organized into subgroups. So like give and take was one subgroup. Um, this one, Bloom, is part of a row of five. And so I was just like five perfect colors of the rainbow. It's a personal pride rainbow. Um, and it, again, not super important, just like a fun fact, I guess. Um, so I think for this grouping of five, all of them are kind of more straightforward. Again, just like building yourself up, moving past trauma, um, taking things that break you, things that, you know, are kind of difficult situations and, uh, trying to create something beautiful with those sharp edges and not letting it just break you. Um, it's not easy. <laughs> and I think it's difficult to say that that should be an expectation, but again, an aspiration, a reminder to myself. Um, and, you know, I th also kind of as a side tangent, um, I think for a lot of us who are in the creative fields and art fields can really relate to just, you know, creativity, I think is, uh, you know, creativity builds resilience. And like, I think a lot of people turned to creative outlets to move past kind of dark, dark times. Um, so anyway, so for this image, <laughs> uh, oh, well, another aspect of like just mirrors, it's kind of fun, you know, like a pun on words of like, what do you reflect on? Like, uh, what do you choose to surround yourself with? Um, I th think you can have this whole like discussion about, human behavior and is it nature or nurture uh and you know obviously it's some combination of both but as adults I think we have more of an ability to move ourselves in, ideally um to change your environment to choose what you're surrounding yourself with um so <laughs> with this image I just have this like mental narrative of, of like hey guys like what are you looking at? I want to see too. Like, I, you know, I want to see what you're seeing and like, I want to be like you. So just this figure who's like almost alien, it's a little bit weird. Like they're like trying to blend in and become the sunflower and they're clearly not, but that's okay. Like there's something, I really just enjoy the earnestness in the awkwardness and like, it's awkward. It's kind of weird, but it's okay. Like it's going to be great. You're trying, trying is what matters. Um, and kind of going again, what we talked about in the beginning, like, you know, that feeling of not belonging. Like, I think at some point you kind of have to move on from just being so self-conscious of not belonging and sort of embrace that like, you know, it's, I don't fit in here, but that's okay. Like, it doesn't really matter. I'm trying to learn from other people and kind of imitate the good traits that I see around me um, and incorporate them into myself in spite of all the experiences that I've had that maybe are trying to prevent that. Um, and, you know, for sunflowers, I think the symbolism there is just, you know, adoration, uh, joy, warmth, sunlight. Uh, I, I really like plants. <laughs> I'm really obsessed with house plants. And I think just being with plants, like there's a lot of a lot of life lessons to be learned from raising plants and just learning about patience and beauty and 
all, like finding peace and all that. I love uh, overcoming death of house plants. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> That's something I, I have to work with. <laughs> yeah, I, I love that, Laya. It's um just the significance of the symbolism of the sunflower being resilient and hopeful. And um, I, yeah, thank you for, for explaining all of that. You're welcome. I'm sorry I have to keep moving around, but I think they stopped the construction. <laughs> oh, you're fine. No, I, I love this piece as well. I think um, walking along, if, if all of you here haven't been able to take a walk, this is near Squatters um, on 3rd South, and uh, it is such a, a beautiful, hopeful, happy piece. So <laughs> I love hearing your story behind it. Um, one thing, too, we, we were hoping to talk a little bit about this piece, Apollo. And um, when we were putting the uh, exhibition together with you, uh, I noticed that you, uh, the titles that you selected for the work were really interesting. And there are uh, a handful of them that are named after uh, Greek gods and Greek mythology. Can you talk a little bit about what inspired you um, to, to name them in that manner? Yeah. Uh, and this is something else that I kind of picked up on in sculpture from Wendy Wisher. Uh, something she would say is just, you know, to title something untitled is a wasted opportunity. Like titles of pieces, like people don't have to read them, but if they do, it's like a piece of candy you can give them and like a spark and just kind of a gateway into the piece. Um, so for, again, so this is a row of four pieces. They're all like on the same street and I named them after Greek gods. It wasn't really intentional at first. Like I didn't, at first I was just like, oh, how do these pieces fit together? There's like maybe an elemental theme. Like I really want my models to be like gender, non-conforming, non-binary gender, like expression. Um, and then there's another piece actually, uh, that's in water and I was like oh and then I looked at the two together and I was like Poseidon and Apollo that's who they are obviously <laughs> um and you know I think you know just in the past decade it's been kind of trendy to like reimagine fairy tales and mythology and whatever but I think like Greek mythology especially I think kind of represents like the canon right like uh convention tradition it's you know uh very just like the symbol of tradition like long-standing tradition and there's nothing wrong with that um but I do think going back to talking about like recontextualizing like how can I maybe subvert your expectation of what a Greek god is like um you know this figure is kind of you know the gender is kind of ambiguous and, and um, they're really young and they're wearing a bright yellow pea coat. <laughs> um, also with the other ones, that's kind of, you know, just going back to not necessarily like completely flipping it on your head, but maybe just like there are other expressions out there that exist and are valid and are not like crazy. Like, it's not like, oh my God, the gay agenda, you know, like, it's just, it's just how people are. Like, it, you know, it's, I, it should be normalized, you know, it's 20, well, now it's, now it's 2021, but like there's so, there was last year, especially so much um, just like uh, public awareness about racial equality, gender equality, 2021. Why are these still questions? Why is this still like unusual? Like, can we normalize this? This is the sort of thing that I really enjoy seeing and I want to just let this be normal. <laughs> so that's kind of where the Greek God uh, titles came from. Thanks for sharing that. So we've got one more image before we open it up the Q and A to our attendees. Um, let's talk about this one, Queen. Laya, tell us about this image. It's it's one of I I know Shelby's favorites and one of my favorites too in the exhibition. Yes. So this is another pairing, um, and there I think they are quite different. Again, so this model is the beautiful drag queen. Her name is Miss Mo like Sister Molly Mormon. Um, she's incredible. Again, also so thankful I got the chance to work with her in the middle of a pandemic. Um, and this is another one that I actually had an idea for quite early on that, um, for, so my 
original idea was I just wanted, I was kind of imagining something with just like saturated color, like unreal colors dripping with glitter and reflections and, you know, kind of leaning into the more like glamour aspect of mirrors and kind of, um, you know, I think this image, like she is a queen, like she radiates glamour and confidence and regality. And that's something, uh, that kind of poise and almost nobility is something I'm really interested in and admire. Um, and I think, you know, it kind of with like mirrors, I think, you know, it comes, sometimes there's this idea of like, you know, like the phrase like two-faced or, you know, I think women and femininity often gets written off as like frivolous or vain and unimportant, um, kind of relating a little bit to how art is like non-essential. Like I, it's sort of take, kind of take it personally, you know, like just because it's beautiful doesn't mean it's not valuable, like the opposite really, right? Um, and also, you know, another thing is I think with the other other pieces, like I got so in my head about like, oh, it's so like art doesn't have to be philosophical or this transcendent thing. It can just be enjoyment and beauty and enjoyment in aesthetic. And uh, I just like, she's just reveling in her own beauty. And it's just wonderful. It's wonderful to see and just, you know, something that I think is kind of naturally captive, like humanity is sort of captivated by that kind of confidence and uh, I don't know, I, like the story of Narcissus in Greek mythology sort of comes to mind, but I do want to have it like the, the positive side of that, right? Like, so she is wearing this mask of mirrors, but also is looking into a reflection. So it's just like, you know, I think uh, like with mirrors, you know, everybody looks in a mirror to see themselves and like, it's technically like a flipped image. It's not like real, but it's still how we can explore ourselves and how we can, um, you know, express ourselves and try to see how, I don't know, just another form of self-perception that I think that I really wanted to put a positive spin on. Thank you for sharing that, Laia. If, if it's all right with you, I'd like to go ahead and um, start the Q&A with the attendees. And I noticed that Matthew Stevens has put a question in the chat. Matthew, would you like to ask your question to Laia? Thanks. Yeah. So first of all, I really enjoyed um, just the afternoon, morning, like maybe it was morning that we went and to, to trans sort of go on this journey through the pieces. And actually the piece we're looking at right now was kind of the way it worked out for us was kind of the, the sort of middle climactic middle point of the journey, which is really interesting. And I kind of felt like, it kind of felt like we started on the outside of the mirror and like how the mirror is kind of like, can be a portal in some ways, especially to give a little context that ties into my question. Like my undergraduate research was on the Japanese no theater, which really centers around masks being like a transformative object and an object that's like a shamanistic object because the idea is that you're literally possessed by the spirit of the mask when you go on and perform. And so for me, it felt like this was the moment where we entered the mirror, this piece, and then suddenly the colors are saturated and suddenly everything is reflected. And then we kind of came out the other side and um, that was really interesting, but um, and it was also interesting for me to hear that you referred to like putting the pieces back together because as some people will know, I have a very deep love for the art of Yoko Ono and it reminded me of her piece, um, Mend piece, where it was about mending things and putting them back together and the value of, of, of that as you put that aspiration. But anyway, I was just curious because I look at the mirror and look at the mask as the sort of like shamanistic or transformative object. And I'm just wondering if you could tell like a little bit about what the role was because it's between us and the model and it, it kind of between the model and the environment. And so how is this, what was, can you tell just a little more about what the mask is doing in there? Yeah, I actually really love the way you put that. And it's not something 
again, just like, wow, people are, there are so many smart people who are more eloquent than I am. Like that's a, I completely agree. I think like that definitely fits with the way I view the work of this like ritualistic, like you put it on and become something else. And so the, the masks are solid. Like the person wearing them can't see past them. Um, and so I think that kind of, uh, fits in with what you were talking about with like you you know you're when you put these on like the person wearing them is no longer just themselves they kind of become this character uh and there's something I think about having one of your senses obscured that is just like kind of liberating where it's like well I'm not myself so I can you know be a little bit more free and I don't know you know (laughs) um again like I I kind of think of these, like the mask is almost like a connection between myself and this other individual wearing it. Like they're no longer separate. Um, I, you know, obviously I'm not like posing them, but in my mind, like they're becoming kind of an extension of myself and what I'm seeing, but also they, it's not just me, it's also them. And then I think uh, the viewer, and then like the other leg of this triangle is the viewer of like what looking at this image like what do you see like what are what connections are you making like how can you I really like what you said about how you're kind of entering the image um and you know why I really hope that you know people can find deeper meaning in my work I guess it's really important to me to have that deeper source and have it be meaningful to me personally. But honestly, if somebody can just find aesthetic enjoyment in them, that's already like awesome. (laughs) But if you can find a deeper connection, that's even more awesome. Like that is the thing that I'm striving for, hopefully. Does that answer your question? I'm not sure. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, thank you. And I guess I would just add that because this, we have this drag performer that's, for me, in my experience of it, happened to be this sort of middle climactic point. It was kind of fun that, like, what happens with who's waiting for you when you enter the mask? And it's this, this delightful drag performer in her moment. And I just felt a little sense of triumph of that. And that, then when I came out the other side, there was like the sunflowers waiting for us. So, yeah, that's, anyway, thanks. Thank you, Matthew, and thank you, Laya. Do we have another question for Laya? You could raise your hand and we can call on you or put something in the chat. I was wondering actually also about the mask because I thought it was really cool how you were talking about how taking like away one sense kind of uh, amplifies the rest. And I was wondering to me, um, especially like earlier you were talking about how the models felt less self-conscious with their face covered. So I was wondering what role do you think vulnerability plays in your work? Because I see this as incredibly vulnerable stuff, but in a different way because usually vulnerability means being able to see a person's face. I love that. Um, Vulnerability is not a word that entered my brain, but I think, again, fits. You're so smart. Incredible. (laughs) People are so much smarter than I am. Um, Yeah, you know, I think if any, it's just, I think, you know, honestly, people were kind of superficial (laughs) in some ways. Like you make just not to say it's good or bad. It just is how it is. You make, you project things onto a split second of seeing somebody's face and then you kind of make all these mental decisions about them. And I think the awareness of that is what makes you self-conscious where it's like, oh, what are people thinking and what kind of snap judgments are they making from me about me based on my, you know, the way I physically look. Um, And so I think having your face covered up, first of all, is just taking away that like, oh, like what weird expressions am I making that people are going to judge me for? (laughs) Like, I think it lets you, your brain just kind of move on and like, start focusing on other more important things. But also, you know, I think vulnerability is a really great word. Um, And, you know, vulnerability doesn't have to mean weakness. Like, I think there's this uh, kind of idea that like, oh, to show 
your vulnerability means to show you at your lowest point, you know, like that's, I think to kind of going back to this idea of trying to make something beautiful from jagged, sharp pieces is just not letting difficult situations harden you and close you off and to stay open, to stay compassionate. I think that's really hard, you know, <laughs> like the older you get, the harder it is. And uh, it's difficult to not be jaded. So vulnerability, I think that's a I'm really stuck on that word. That's a great word um, to, to try like to not focus on your face, to not focus on the physical top layer of things and to try to see beyond that and to try to feel more of a connection rather than just to make a snap judgment and throw on a facade, I think is uh, something I think about a lot and quite important to me. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Alexis. Thanks, Laia. So I think we have time for one more question. Is anyone else in the part of the group have something for Laia? A comment or a question about, about her work? Looks like John Ford. I'll go. Um, when I first saw these, I, I kind of interpreted each of the each of the pieces as the person hiding themselves away, like essentially just showing society what it wants to see by literally reflecting society back to itself and hiding them true selves away from, from everyone and everything. Is that, was that worked into any of the dis decision processes of these pieces? Uh, I don't know that it was consciously, but that's again, it's the opposite of what Alexa said, but I'm also like, yeah, 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 that sounds right. <laughs> like it can be both. And I think the balance between duality is always present. Um, I think maybe for more so for some than others, um, it's definitely, I think mirrors kind of make you think of like, it, it kind of connects back to that idea of like the, the viewer, like the, the figure wearing the mask is not necessarily the subject. The subject is the viewer because you're looking at a mirror. Um, so whether or not that means like the figure is hiding themselves away, I think can be open to interpretation um, and maybe based on different images. Um, like for, for this one specifically while we're on here, I don't feel like that, that figure is hiding anything. They're like, yeah, come at me. Um, and in a way it's kind of like, can I, you know, can I take these, you know, everybody has different, everybody's very different, but can I take the good aspects and try to imitate them and try to reflect them back or try to see myself in other people? Um, Cause you know, it's, it's just perception is so weird. Like, can you ever really truly see yourself? Can you truly see another person? Can you, you know, ever see somebody the way they see themselves? I think the answer is no. Can you try? That's trying is important. And how we, you know, how we approach that, I think is what you can control. And, you know, I feel like I'm getting really preachy. <laughs> like this isn't like, man, I think this is, I, I'm very idealistic. And I think I'm very, I think some of my ideas are a little bit naive <laughs> at times. Like it, this is more of like a philosophical question rather than like a practical like advice necessarily of how the world needs to be. But I do think that, you know, whether you place yourself as a viewer, whether you place yourself separated, looking at the image, trying to find a reflection, or if you can place yourself as the figure that the image is of, uh, both are valid and important. I think just whatever, whatever you need <laughs> to see and kind of wishy-washy on that answer. <laughs> thank you, Laya, that was a fantastic answer. And thank you all for being here today. Thank you, Shelby Lang, for um, your interview questions for Laya. And 
Thanks for being here. This was such a fantastic opportunity to engage with you, Laya. Um, for those that haven't had the opportunity to see the show, it's up until the end of March. You can just follow Broadway downtown, which is 300 South between 2nd East and 2nd West and walk, walk the corridor there and you'll see all 14 pieces by Laya Yang. Any anything to close us out, Laya? Would you like to say any last, last regards? Uh... Yeah, I mean, just for, you know, thank you guys so much. Also, I don't know if anybody, any of them are here, but I really, really want to thank like everybody who was involved in the printing and installation of these placards. Like it was freezing in January when these had to go up. <laughs> like they work so hard. I am so appreciative. That's, you know, things that go unnoticed. Thank you so much. Um, and I hope something that I really hope that for me, I feel like this was a really great project for me just to self-reflect and to kind of uh, verbalize some things that I value and I want to work on and keep in mind in the future. And I hope it's just can remind people about personal agency and the importance of choosing to grow, choosing beauty and, you know, to build rather than just to let things stay the way they are. <laughs> I think those are perfect words to end this discussion on. Thank you so much. And uh, just want to acknowledge that Zap here um, has been one of our partners as well, and that this is part of their virtual uh, bingo adventure. So thank you to Zap for helping to support this project again. Thank you all. And we will see you um, for our next Lunch and Learn in the next few months. And again, don't forget to check out Laya. You can follow her on Instagram and her show will be up through the end of March.